tell there? Mm -hmm. One yeah. quick question. Sure. So you brought up that Solomon had what, 700 wives? Yeah, Correct. And 300 on the side. And 300 concubines. What's the difference, just for clarification, what is the difference between a wife and a concubine? Would it be like rights? Like, a, like things that they would get? Specifically. Um, no, that, that's, that's not exactly because a, a concubine was counted in every practical way as though they were a wife. There was nothing, it was not in any way seen as being immoral to be uh, sexually involved with a concubine. There was, that was viewed with the same kind of uh, acceptance as, as a wife, but there was one major difference. They didn't get any um state um well they they wouldn't have gotten a state either way their sons couldn't be <clears throat> i'm sorry their sons couldn't be a ruler yeah the the uh the big difference is with with a concubine the children could not be the heir oh uh. So that that was the big difference. So when Solomon had those three hundred concubines, they their children were not in any way in the lineage to be part of the king. Okay, so my question is, do they have like a traditional marriage? Like, did they have any type of marriage ceremony? Sure. So he had seven hundred marriage ceremonies. Yeah. And then why would he need a concubine? Because like he had seven hundred wives. It's not like. He's like, oh, gee, I, I'm tired of this one. He has 700 <laughs> women. What and what would he need 300 concubines for? He wanted. To I would need one more than one wife. I can't imagine having two, let alone 700. <laughs> uh, understand why did Solomon have 700 wives? And then we'll talk about the concubines in a minute. To make allegiances. It was for combining of uh, areas. Like uh... well, most, if not the vast majority of those marriages were political marriages. Why did you have a political marriage? So you can have it solidified your um, agreement with the neighboring. neighboring country. Not only a neighboring country. But for defense. But also with Legions. subordinate people within your own country. So if you have a powerful clan leader in Israel, that person may send one of their daughters to marry the king. And that cements the relationship between that family and the throne. How does that work? How does that make the alliance, this alliance? It wasn't 700 clans. <laughs> Each father said that. <laughs> well, there were, there were a, a lot of clans in Israel. Every tribe had, had a number. So there were, there were a lot of them. Uh, but no. then you have the same thing outside of Israel. So you, it's not only with kings, but it, again, it's, some of these clan leaders were as powerful as a king because each clan has how did see in america if you compare things to america today uh, what is our military might as america air force different fractions like air force it is it is the 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 federal government's army and the defense of the nation falls to this army. In, in those days, there was not that big of a standing army. It wasn't professional soldiers with all this equipment. What was most of the army? Fathers and sons. They were people from the various tribes 
who would show up for the war. And starting with David, you started to have a standing army, but they simply became the officers. The vast majority of the guys swinging a sword or shooting a bow were farmers yesterday. Who was their allegiance to? Who was their allegiance to? Their the leaders of their tribes. Their tribes. Maybe not even their tribal leader, but their Family. clan leader. Their primary, the person that they followed was Uncle John, who runs our clan. And you'd have a hundred clans would make up the tribe. So if the tribe needed to go to war, the clan leaders had to support it. If the tri tribal leader said, hey, we're going to war, and all the clan leaders go, bye, he had nobody. If the king said, we're going to war, and all the tribal leaders said, no, hey, have a good time. So you needed to keep the support of those clan leaders and those tribal leaders. Whenever you went to war with another nation, what was the outcome of that war most of the time? You got whatever was left over. If I'm King David or I'm King Solomon and I go to war with the Hittites, or the Amalekites, or the Jebusites, or the Electricites, or the Suburbanites, any of those guys. <laughs> but what was the outcome normally? Well, you normally get two the things would happen. Then they'd be told by God to kill everybody. Well, that only happened a couple of times. That happened every times. time. They would. Kill them, they would take some plunder, but they, but that, that's very early in the tribal where they're conquering the land. I'm talking now in the tribe time of the kingdom, in, in the time of David or Hezekiah. <clears throat> what would happen if I go to war with some of these other, if they go to war with me? Whoever loses, what happens to them? They pay tribute and become slaves. They pay tribute and they become a subject territory. Basically, what that means is every year they give so much money and they would promise to be loyal to whoever won. How do you enforce that? Military practice. Well, we're going to say... You don't have military forces because what are all of your military forces? They're gone because they were in the They're battle. farmers. Most of the year, where do you need them? Farming. Farming. If they're not farming, what happens? Everybody dies of starvation. That's why in the Bible, it will say things in David's day. During the season of war. What was the season of war? When there wasn't anything to Summertime. do in the farms. When there wasn't anything to do. What was the brackets around the season of war? There was a beginning of the season of the war. There was the end of the season of war. What was the beginning and the end? Planting and harvesting. Planting and harvest. You plant the crops. Now you can go off to war because you don't need anybody to sit there and watch them. But as soon as harvest comes, bring them back. Everybody's got to go home. The few months in between those, then you go fight. And in the winter time, it's too cold. Nobody goes anywhere. World shuts down. So how do you keep these people paying their tribute and being faithful? To you, you marry their daughter. Why? Because they won't attack family. Well, maybe it's not the daughter that's the problem. Because again, and this sounds crass, but in that world, how much was a daughter valued? Was a daughter enough to keep you from? 
being disloyal? And the crass answer is probably not. But with the daughter would come what? Okay. Ah, grandchildren. I'm Solomon. You all have to give a daughter for me to marry. Now what do I have in my household? Your kids. Your grandchildren. <laughs> Your grandchildren. And that means if you misbehave, what? We kill the grandchildren. I've got hostages. that I can hold your children, your grandchildren hostage. You step out of line, your grandchildren pay for it. So those 700 women very well may not have been there for any, oh, I love this man. They were there to provide children not because I love you and want to form a family with you, but because I want hostages to make sure you're. They all lived in a palace? Yeah. How big was this place? Huge. Well, some of them was the 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 And some. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Huge palace. Yeah. Bigger than the yeah. Well, uh, how, long, how long did it take to build? The temple of God when Solomon built it. Seven years and four months. How long did it take to build his palace? Fourteen years. Fourteen years. Oh, okay. So how large was the temple? <laughs> it was the largest man-made flat area on the face of the earth when it was built. So his palace was twice as elaborate. Why did Solomon bankrupt Israel? It took so much food to, to feed his palace people that each tribe had to, how many tribes were there? There's 12 tribes, 12 months. And there's 12 months. So what was the thing? Each tribe had a month. Each tribe has a month to, pay, to, to feed the fly. If you're a huge tribe like Judah, you're hurting, but you can do it. You're a little tribe like Benjamin. Good luck. <laughs> you're going bankrupt. Your children are not eating so that his palace can have all the delicacies. Which goes right back to why God said they didn't want a king. Yep, indeed. They need a king. So if we've mm -hmm. talked about these 700 wives who are providing children, but those children aren't about having this family, they're about keeping everybody loyal. Why the 300 concubines? Why the 300 concubines? The, those 300 concubines were probably the women that Solomon, and again, it's crazy that there's 300 of them. <laughs> <laughs> but they're the women that, that Solomon married for love. Okay, so you're telling me out of 700 women, he didn't, he couldn't love any, like, he didn't love seven. Any... I'm, I am not saying that, but I am saying that he couldn't make that his primary thing because, again, if they're there to keep whoever I've made this treaty with in line. Can I afford to love them? Can't uh, play favorites. Because what might I have to do tomorrow? Kill them. I might have to kill their children or torture their children or cut off the finger of a child or some to mail it back to, to granddad and say, if you want the other 10, I can send them to. So he can't afford to do that. And Solomon begins to get in trouble. Why? Mabel. Well, because each of those 700 women had other gods to care for. 
hostages. Yeah, because again, they're there basically as hostages. They bring their gods with them. But Solomon begins to get enamored of some of them. And what happens as a result of that? He builds temples. He starts pursuing their gods and their... So it is a very, very complicated situation. Well, it sounds rather indulgent to me. Like Oh, it, it was it's, entirely. It's selfish and indulgent. There's nothing good about yep. it. Like, I'm surprised God wasn't. Well, there was there was one thing good about it, and there was. Why did God tolerate multiple marriage? Because Solomon obviously is not the only person who has multiple wives. David has. David had quite a few. Yeah. Uh, not compared to Solomon, right. but he had well into the twenties, maybe thirty. Oh, <laughs> uh, also. Why does why? Does God tolerate any level? And, and many, many, the vast majority of men in Israel in that time frame had at least two wives, maybe three. It would have been the very, very rare person who did not have two to three wives. Why? So Jesus said it was because of the hardness of your heart that, God, that Moses allowed divorce. Jesus said, from the beginning, God's plan was one man, one. one man, one woman. Why did God allow multiple marriage? Population. What about it? People they could have more children, the more army, you know. Uh, I mean, you look at it on a farm. I mean, you know, that they have chickens and they have just seven. Because people breeders, didn't live that long. Chickens, right, so. You needed people. You that. you have a lot of bad things that can happen. Wild animals take the children down. First of all, far more men die young than women because of war, but not just war. Disease. Disease hits men and women equally. Maybe even men a little worse than women, but both equally. What's the other big one? We have a whole government program about it. It starts with an O. Yeah. What's a government agency that starts with O? Every kid in my school that I work with has to take training in it. OSHA. OSHA. What's OSHA about? Safety. Safety. Safety in the workplace. Did they have OSHA? No. What was the death rate for people who have to deal with bulls and, and plows and mules and lifting heavy things and building walls that sometimes collapse and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? How many men die in their teens or 20s doing the kind of hard physical labor in very dangerous situations. A lot more back then. A lot of them. So between war and work, you have a drastic reduction in the male population. How many children can a man have? Many. Thousand? 10,000? How many children can a woman have? One every six months. Nine months. Nine months. Uh, it's not, uh, it's Christmas. not my, <laughs> yeah. And not, and, 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 and not, right? it's actually closer to a year. You, <laughs> you have to recover. You have to recover. Yeah. So, so, but how many total children? That's a misnomer because most women can most women have a child a year. No, I know a lady that practically did. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the world's record is there's one woman uh, from South America that I was read about uh, had sixty nine children. Now was that with twins and triplets? Every single birth was multiple births. Wow. Um. She had 69 children, the quads, she had quads, triplets. Wow. For, for 30 some years, she had children pretty much one a year. How many women are physically able to do that? 
That's why she's the world record holder. <laughs> many, many women, many, many women can only have two or three children at most. Yeah. What happens? Well, you have a you have a hard delivery, you you have a hard pregnancy, and what happens internally? Put stress on the body. You you have damage to the womb, you have damage to heart, you get an infection. The heart gets damaged a lot. The heart gets damaged. You have uh, and remember they have no antibiotics. You get an infection, and what results from that infection? You did. You but but often sterility. If you don't die, sterility. So now they can't have any more children. So you have somebody like um Isaac's has two wives. What happens with the two wives? Rachel and uh yeah, yeah, one has a whole lot of kids, six, six or something like that. And then he had a concubine who has a couple more. Um, but Rachel, the wife he really loves, has two. No, two. Yeah, two. Two. Yeah. And and never is able to have any more. Didn't God stop her from having kids originally? No. Yes or no. Uh, no, they, that, they that was she was slow married. Mm -hmm. Um, you have you have uh, uh, <clears throat> Samuel's mother, who can have one child. Then she had others. She had so If you are going to have a society in the ancient Middle East where one out of one or two out of five children don't live to their fifth birthday, in every family, you have one or two child, children dead before five, usually two. So you've got to have five children just to have three. What is the just replacement level? What's the just replacement level? Do the math. What's the just replacement level? One, two. If you've got a man and a woman who it takes to have a child, how many children do they have to have just to replace themselves? Two. two. If you have to have five children to have three, just to five years of age, and then how many of those are going to make it to 20 or, or even 15 where they're having children of their own? Maybe just two. Now you're down to exactly reproducing your, your, what you have. What do you have to have happening constantly if you want to keep your society? I have to keep growing. You have to have every single woman in the society have as many children as she is physically able to have. So what does that mean to marriage? Multiple wives. Every single woman has to marry. Because you need every one of those women to produce children. Now, if there are a lot more women than men, because the men are dying much younger and at a faster rate than women, what are the two choices that you have? And there's only two. Immorality or multiple marriages. Those are the two choices. Out of those two choices, which one did God pick? Multiple. Multiple marriages. Now, there's another thing for women. It may seem like that's a horrible thing that you have to be one of three or four wives. But there is another bad situation. What's the bad situation from a, from a woman's point of view? Who's your husband? Who has the first? When there's more than men, there's more women than men. What's the bad situation? Favorite to. Yeah. To never have children. If you do, aren't allowed to marry multiple women with one man, you have every possibility that you will not have children. What does that mean? Stigmatized. Maybe, but 
in practical terms, Who's what does that care? mean? What is social security for them? Males. Their children. Children. The only thing you have to protect you into old age is having children. So, again, in a, this world, it's not an ideal world. It's a world that's a very real world with real problems. You've got two choices. And those two choices are, number one, be part of a, mar a multiple marriage where you've got one man and multiple women. The other choice is um, never have children. Not have any social security. Which situation would be worse from the woman's perspective? So therefore, what does God do? He allows that to happen. Because it is the what? Lesser of two evils. Yeah, exactly right. What do you call something that is in that situation? What does that make these multiple marriages? Two words. Necessary evil. A necessary evil. The man considered an adulterer? Nope. Um. He's having it in every one of those people in that marriage is part of the marriage. So we live in a very, very, very prosperous time. The poorest people in America. Do you know what people look like who are starving? I was I, I really challenged the kid about that. I see the other day. time in the street. Seriously, I'm not even making it up. Not in America. No, they have these giant stomachs. They have these huge bloated stomach and their arms are literally this big around and their legs. You know, World Vision sent out a thing one time. It's a yeah. little piece of paper tape. And it was so small. They said that was the measurement of the average kids. Uh, I think it was breast or something. If you if you watch the pictures from the people who were carried out of the concentration camps in Europe, that's what it looks like when a person is starving. Well, it's to the point where they you can't even just feed them; they have to have some kind of special yep. nourishment. They yep. get sick. Literally, their body has so little energy that if they eat food, the amount of energy it takes to digest the food will kill them. Are the poorest people in America anywhere near that level? No. no. We live in a very, very wealthy time. Can we afford to have a huge number of women who never marry or never have children? Yeah. Will that destroy our society and we'll be done in less than a generation if we have women who never have children? Yeah. No. Can, do we have safety nets for women as they age and for men that if they don't have children, their lives won't be destroyed by aging without children to care for them? Look at abortion. That's important. We have quote unquote social security. We also have, and you may not like that, but we have nursing homes. That may be something that people say that's a horrible thing, but can you imagine being 80 years old and living on the streets? No. They would have, literally. We have the resources that we don't need any of those things. So it's very easy for us to stand up on this moral high ground and go, we will not tolerate that. Because we don't have to live with the consequences that they would have had God not allowed it. Let's talk about a different area of life. Let's talk about drinking. What's the Bible say about drinking? New Testament. 
What does Paul say about drinking? No drunkard. Don't drink us to be drunk. What else? Without no drunkard will. What else? What else? Something about the Holy Spirit and not being drunk. Don't be drunk with wine, but filled with the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 5. Uh, Galatians. What else? Uh, Galatians, I think it's 5. Uh, it talks about uh, not being able to inherit the kingdom of God. It's like drunkenness and, and like other and sins. And what else? Timothy, it says to take a little wine. And Paul says in Timothy, and writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy, don't drink just water, drink wine as well. Why? Because the water what had bacteria in it, and the alcohol would kill it. Would help to kill it and would help to, to keep us, a, a human being, from becoming very ill with di the diseases like horrible disease. Dysentery. Yeah. The fermentation, the alcohol kills a lot of the bacteria that, that causes all those problems. When I was in Argentina, they drank, even the youngest kids drank wine instead of the water. They literally couldn't drink their water. Yep. Yep. Most of their drunk. Yep. When I was overseas, we could do it as well for soldiers who were like 19, 20. Yep. <laughs> um, again, why does Paul say to Timothy, drink that wine? If you were to go back in our country's history, not very far, how far back do you have to go before they needed to do that? 1920s. Yeah, early 20th century is really where that begins, that, that you didn't need to drink alcohol every day. Why? What changed? Uh, antibiotics don't come into the 30s, well, very late 30s, early 40s. Water purification. Cleaner water, better, better dug wells where they were digging deeper wells where the, the there wasn't as much bacteria. But what else? Refrigeration. So you don't have you don't have the rotted meat. But the spoiled meat. Or the liquids in there. The yeah. Prior to that, if you were to go back to the to the founding fathers, if you were to sit down with George Washington or any of those guys, many of whom claimed to be Christians, many of whom were pastors, and, and if you read their sermons, were godly pastors, what would have happened on a daily basis? They'd have been drinking like fish. Some did, but they were drinking hard stuff, too. Because well, it couldn't have been that week because how could it kill germs if it was that right. week? So. They they were drinking, they were drinking rum, they were drinking whiskey, they were drinking beer, but but I'm talking they were drinking hard liquor because if you drown a couple of shots with your food, it's gonna kill a lot of that bacteria. So why did they do that? Again, what does that make alcohol? Yeah, see, so we have to understand when we put ourselves, and this is where we have to talk so much about with the Bible. It's not just enough to read a verse. You have to read the verse within what? The context. The context. And what are the circles of context that you always have to take into account? I'm sorry. I can never remember them. I said, here we go. <laughs> what are the circles of contacts? So draw, write the word verse in the middle of a blank sheet. Draw a ring around it. Whoop. Now draw a ring around that ring. What's inside that first ring? What's in that side that first ring? Applicable context? Environment? Verse, immediate surrounding verses. Immediate surrounding verses. Check the scripture with scripture. 
Well, this is this is the circles of context. So the first thing you have to do is the immediate surrounding verses. If I'm reading verse 10, I have to to put it in context. I have to read 11 and 9. At, at least probably 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, something like that. At least a paragraph or two around it. Draw another circle. What's in the next circle? Uh, I would put chapter probably there. The, the entirety of the chapter, maybe even two chapters. So if I'm reading the book of Ephesians and he's talking about, you know, uh, about living a godly life, I can't just pull a verse out of chapter four. I have to read all of chapter four to get the flow of what he's talking about, what the godly life is. What's the next circle? Draw another circle. What's the next circle? Those, the whole book, letter, whatever it is. What's the next circle? Other writings by the same author. So if I'm reading something from the Apostle Paul, and I really want to get the context, I better write and read all the other stuff that the Apostle Paul said about that topic. I can't just read 1 Corinthians 7 about marriage and not read Ephesians 4. Because if I just read one of those two without the other one, I'm only getting half the message about marriage. That makes sense? What's the next circle? Draw another circle. What's the next circle? External references to the. No. In the Bible. Yeah, other books in the Bible, specifically within that testament. If I'm reading, if I'm reading, you know, something from Isaiah, if I really want to understand it, what else do I have to read? Well, I better be reading Kings and Chronicles to get the historical setting of what Isaiah is writing, right? Maybe I need to be right, reading the other prophets to see what they were saying at the same time period or a little before or a little after. Let's do one more with the Bible. <laughs> One more soul line can do. <laughs> the other, the other testament. Yeah, the the entirety of scripture. Are there any other verses that are relevant to this that I'm ignoring because I don't like what they say? <laughs> now we need to go outside the Bible. What's the next, what's the next layer of context? Historical books. The culture to which it was written. The Old Testament is written in a much different, to a much different culture than the first, than, than the first century New Testament. The New Testament is written in what culture? The Roman culture, which was a much different animal than the culture at the time of Moses, when big nations didn't really exist. Much different than when the prophets are writing five, six, seven hundred years after Moses, when you've got the rise of empires and you've got these huge empires fighting like Egypt, fighting against Assyria or against Babylon or against Persia. Greece attacking, you know, and Israel's caught in the middle of all this upheaval of these giant empires. Much different thing than when Israel is a bunch of shepherds squeezing sand between their toes and nobody with a sword for a thousand miles. That makes sense. And then finally, if you want to make one more circle, 
<laughs> you can you can <laughs> lose. <laughs> you you can say other ancient writings. Other ancient writings. The greatest journey did a good job of that stuff. It took you all into other writings and stuff. Yeah. How can we understand the New Testament books today that when the King James was translated, <laughs> there wasn't any concept of understanding what those words meant? Dead Sea Scrolls? No, they were written long before the New Testament, 200 years. How can we understand what's the New Testament written in? Koine Greek. How can we understand the Koine Greek of the New Testament so much better than the people who translated the King James Bibles 500 years ago? Are you talking about when they opened up the mummies and they found the stuffing? During the middle of the 20th century, they found near one of the uh, pyramids where they had buried a bunch of things for the pharaoh buried in that pyramid, which happened in about 100 BC. They found a massive amount of crocodiles buried there because they worshiped crocodiles. How did they keep these crocodiles buried there that they've lasted for 2,000 years? They filled them with paper. What were those papers? Old records. They were old bureaucratic records from the Egyptian uh, government. They were government papers that were old deeds and all kinds of letters and official writings. What language were they written in? Koine Greek, not classical Greek. Suddenly we had a huge library of letters with all those words in the New Testament that now we can put in context of what they meant in that society. So now you can take, well, this word to telestai is the word that they wrote across the mortgage when it was paid off. So when Jesus says to telestai, we know the context now. The full debt's been paid off. It's not a theological term. It is a practical living term that's given a theological meaning. Much better understood than when we just say, well, it's a theological word. But again, it's that context that gives it that understanding. That's where we have to bring when we really want to understand the scripture. And see, if you go, what have we been doing today? We haven't been doing the verse and the verses right around it. And what have we been doing today? Which one of those rings? Which one of those rings? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Culture. Yeah, the culture. So in order to understand all these things in the Old Testament that people yell and scream about today and see how you've got to put them in the culture of that time. What did that culture face? What were the problems they had that we don't have to deal with? I, you know, that's why the Bible doesn't say read the Bible. To study to show thyself yep. proved unto God. Yeah. And and let's be really honest. If you've got to have a surgery tomorrow, do you want a doctor who uh, who read a few medical texts or one who studied well, medicine? I told you, said, hey, you know I'm not really a doctor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I play one on TV. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, Experience gave me this. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the best of those was the guy that would go in they're, they're all standing around these people are all standing around and these lights are going off and they go the core is melting down 
the nuclear power plant's going to explode at any minute. This guy goes, step out of the way. And he starts pushing buttons and the reds stop and the, the things go back into the green and the yeah. lights stop. They go, wow, are you a nuclear engineer? He goes, no, but I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. So, and again, do you understand that's why God commissioned, and, and that brings us back to Ephesians 4, where it talks in Ephesians 4 about God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to prepare God's is everyone on earth capable of having all the information at their fingertips to do all these circles of context? Mm. It takes a lot of learning, study, organized study. You need to be taught it, just like going to medical school or engineering school or any other thing. Is it possible to learn it on its uh, learn it on your own? Mm, possible. Abraham Lincoln was a pretty decent lawyer, and he did it by reading books. You certainly learned an awful lot of it. <laughs> yeah, but it is a lot better to have had some organized study in there to lay the foundation that you can then build on. Fast too, sure. Plus, and, some people learn things easier than others. And that's where something like Bible college and seminary are are so important. Is that something that every believer has to do? No. no. That's why God calls certain people to this role so that they can share that with everyone. That makes sense. God bless. Have a great week. See you all. Thanks, Tom. Later, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.